Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. We really appreciate you taking the time in to come on and speak with us about the legendary Bob Nalbandian. And, you know, anybody who's familiar with Bob and his career, of course, knows how close and connected he had been to, to you guys in the Megadeth camp over the last 40 years. And right. so I, I know you've obviously got plenty of memories that you've obviously shared experience with him. Uh, but before we get into your history with Bob um, and what he's done for Megadeth, especially in the early part of the band's career, I mean, you've obviously presently got a lot going on with your current career. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start with the Lucid. I mean, you guys obviously just dropped the new single, Risk Machine, uh, the right. third one off the upcoming EP, <clears throat> Saddle Up and Ride. Uh, so go ahead, David, and I guess uh, fill us in on all the happenings with the Lucid, the new EP, and then guess what we can expect to see in the future sure. with the band. <clears throat> so we're like the world's greatest internet band, uh, and I say that because we've never gone out and played a show. We tried last year. <laughs> Unfortunately, our guitar player, Drew, had a cancer scare, and he got through that, so everything's good. Um, and that gave us a little more time. The EP was basically done. We were still mixing it. So it gave us a little time to kind of make sure we got that, you know, uh, finished up properly. And, uh, so the first album came out in, uh, what October, I think October, uh, 2021. <clears throat> and we, we put the songs out, then we put the videos out and, you know, then we intended to do the shows. Um, which had to be, you know, pulled off the calendar with, uh, for his health reasons, but, um, sure. everything's good. Drew's fine. And, um, so he kind of works full time on this and of course making horror movies and other stuff that he does. So, um, you know, it's funny with the lucid, we, so, you know, we had, I told him, I said, man, I've got this King of the Crash stuff, you know, teeing up here for the new year and, you know, on the tour and we got a live album that's coming out in Cleopatra here in March. So I said, look, if, there, there's a window and it's basically December. It has to come out. At least they sort of announce it, get it out. The record's actually going to come out uh, in two weeks on January 27th. And it's a five song, <coughs> excuse me, five song EP. So, you know, as everything with the Lucid, it's kind of, you know, counter culture to the typical protocol of the music business. Um, right. And that's by Drew's design. You know, he's just got good instincts with it. Um, you know, we shopped it around to some labels and they're mostly the metal labels. And of course this wasn't their cup of tea, you know? So it's funny how we knew we had a really good album, you know, and it's a really good band and we make really cool, fun music. Um, but it's, you know, it doesn't really slice into a genre. So, you know, labels mm -hmm. are all, but they're basically marketing tools, right? So they didn't really, I don't know, where do we put this, you know? So, mm -hmm. so it's funny that since it's come out, people love it. You know, they really like it. You can just tell by the, the reaction to it. It's, it's something that's, it's fresh. <clears throat> it's always unexpected. And, um, so the first single we, I told Drew, I said, dude, why don't you just drop it? Like, you know, the day before the Christmas this weekend, I said, the music industry is shut down. You know, the industry shuts down pretty much as you guys know, by about mid sure. November, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, there's no more ads at radio, you know, nobody, no one in their right mind would throw a bunch of money behind a record heading into the holidays because everybody's going right. on vacation. So since, you know, we're basically an internet band, um, you know, we can do whatever we want, you know? So I, you know, of course there's not much news going on through the holidays. So I said, well, fuck it. Let's make some headlines. We'll blow the shit up and drop, drop songs during the holidays. So, um, the first one that had, uh, Violet J from insane clown posse. I think that that got a rise out of everyone. They're like, Whoa, you know, we never saw this coming. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love that. Uh -huh. I love that. You know, story uh -huh. of my career, you know, just fucking <laughs> blow people's minds. You know what I mean? So, uh, <clears throat> kind of gotten used to it now. Um, and, uh, so that's, uh, I thought that was fun. And then, you know, we decided right before new year's, we would drop the second single. Um, and, uh, which was very cool because that song, <clears throat> you know, we were kind of figuring out how to do it. I got on the phone with Drew and Mike Keller, uh, our drummer. And I said, you know, it needs this kind of, not chili peppers, but this kind of incubus funk kind of thing, you know? And I, and I, and after, after we agreed to it, I, I sat down with my bass and really came in here and just picked my bass up and started, you know, getting my eighties, you know, funk groove on and, uh, and got to play bass in a very different way. You know, usually people hear me with a pig playing thrash metal and all that stuff, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> I actually do know how to play bass in many other genres and many other styles. And so it's fun that in that sure. band, I can do all that, you know, um, it's, we learned years ago, probably the Risk album being the perfect example. It's hard to bring all things in under one umbrella, especially yeah, when a yeah. brand has sort of been established. So I think for me, having Ellison Soto, The Lucid. Where'd he go? Record. 
Dias record will be coming out. You know, I've kind of got the four pillars of my life that hold the hold the roof up over me. You know, so um, so the lucid, you know, it, it it's got its corner. You know, and and it's fun because we can kind of do whatever the hell we want with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking, you know, the earlier earlier part of uh, Megadeth's career, as I said before, Kings of Thresh, featuring you and ex Megadeth guitarist Jeff Young. Uh, you guys obviously are out going to be playing uh, the albums Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good and So Far So Good So What in its entirety, which is great, man. I know you're gearing up to hit the road uh, next month uh, for a long East Coast and Midwest run. So I guess talk about mm-hmm. that tour and everything you got going on with Kings of Thresh. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, that, that idea came to me when I was at the Chiller Theater in New Jersey back in uh, – I guess it was Halloween of 2021 and um, people were bringing me killing is my business records to sign of all, you know, original combat versions to, you know, the latest or the final kill. And, you know, of course we started the tour back there, I think at Hammer Jacks in Baltimore. And we, you know, kind of, that was 1985 when we were on tour with Exciter and it just hit me, you know, it's, it's, I wanted to play the album when we reissued the final kill. I thought it would have been cool to go out one night only um and do that um of course we saw last year metallica you know when they were doing their 40th anniversary they did all these little pop-up shows and Mm -hmm. you know that was kind of what i wanted to do with that record just one night only go play the metro in chicago you know like Mm -hmm. just some place where we'd actually played the record you know and it just got poo-pooed you know so i was like well fuck it i'm gonna go do it you know because uh i know the songs (laughs) you know uh, (laughs) so (laughs) Um, and you know, the truth of it is, is, you know, I've watched over the years, you know, that that record has just kind of been this, you know, this, this sleeper cult classic, you know, and again, it's like a horror movie, you know, it just sort of sleeps in the background and sort of creeps up. And all of a sudden it, it's, it's, it's one that everybody just can't wait to get out, you know, to, to get a hold of again. And, 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 uh, you know, I'd actually called Chris Paul and said, Hey dude, let's go play killing and peace cells and. He agreed, and then he called me. Literally called me back 15 minutes later and goes, "Dude, I can't do that. I don't have enough time in my schedule to do that." You know, and I said, "Just relax. Well, the time will come." You know, so I called the promoter here in town, and we got the wheels turning on it. And you know, we were thinking about doing it in early 2022, but we knew it was going to happen. It just needed to find the right time, you know. And Jeff had called me to go out to uh, jam at the whiskey. They do the ultimate jam night. Uh, Chuck Wright from quiet riot as part of that um sure as are some of the people that, that work with the bullet boys <laughs> and um so they put together you know a tribute to the big four and jeff said dude you want to come out and jam i said fuck yeah man so i booked my own flight as i always do you know i just pay my own way get on a plane and just go get in the room get on the stage be part of the action and you know because from there came kings of thrash i mean that night mm-hmm. Chaz leon <laughs> was our excuse me was our singer and our guitar player so he's part of the group Fred Aking, who plays in the Bullet Boys, he'd actually played with some of the Slayer, uh, you know, ensembles that had performed later in the night. So we saw him play. I said, that guy's friggin' good. So we grabbed him to be part of Gigs of Thrash. So, you know, yeah, just being in the room, you know, we we sort of built the band off that off that night. And um, sure. Now here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, and it gives it gives fans it, and and this is this is probably a perfect lead into Bob it gives it gives even older fans that didn't discover the band until peace sells which is probably i would probably still say is most of the fans you know they didn't really get to hear killing is my business live but there was a few people that were involved in you guys's world back in that time that that did and right. obviously bob now bandian was one of them you know there was just that little collection of guys that were so supportive long before there was an internet you know long before when when you had to send a pen pal a letter or whatever to to talk about you got to see this band coming out so why don't why don't we go there david and talk about as early as you remember meeting bob and and that whole community not only bob but the the community of journalists that really helped put you guys in metallica and you know other bands on the map well, Bob was Dave's friend. Um, you know, so I, I moved to uh, L.A. from Minnesota. I land there, you know, June 1, 1983. Uh, land into this whole other scene. Of course, the US Festival just happened. Um, <clears throat> Randy Rhodes had passed away. So there's a lot of excitement around um, 
sadness, but then also excitement around, you know, uh, there's Brad Gillis about Night Rangers on the map because he played on Speak of the Devil with Ozzy. Right. Um, you know, Ozzy, Ozzy getting his musicians out of L.A. put a lot of people on the map, you know. So suddenly Jakey e. Lee. So now we've heard of Rat, um, you know, because he was in Mickey Rat, I guess, you know. So now all of a sudden yeah. we know of Rat. We know of Night Ranger. We know of all these bands just from the guitar players. And of course, from Randy and then <laughs> Rudy Sarso, we know of Quiet Riot. So, you know, three bands in particular popped on the radar just because of the musician Dazi cut in his band. Um, and for kids like me in the Midwest, where if you say pre-internet, you know, news traveled very slow by way of Circus Magazine, um, you know, these hip parader, these kind of things. <clears throat> um, maybe Metal Edge was out at that time. Um, but, you know, so mostly you know, grocery store, rock magazine. So now I'm in LA, I meet Dave, this whole other underground scene is happening of which of course Metallica is the leader because, you know, Motley, Quiet Riot, Rats, Wasp, these guys, you know, they're, they had taken off on the runway and, um, you know, we're on their way. Now this next scene, which would be known as thrash metal some years later, uh it was the deal as was Ingve. you know Ing mike barney had just brought Ingve over from sweden and sure. he was playing in ron keel's band steeler <clears throat> and i remember we went out to go see steeler i think they opened for loudness uh loudness had played their was playing their very first show in america at the country club so just you know man i couldn't have gotten there at, <clears throat> at a better time you know and of course dave right <clears throat> in his um you know kicking around the idea for his next band post metallica uh, me and my friend Greg Handovit, um, you know, joined forces with him. We, you know, we um, through, you know, the, the, you know, the early Dave was writing stuff, but during the rehearsals, and then we decided to call the band Megadeth. You know, that was the impetus of forming our band. So, you know, a lot of excitement around Dave, what his next step was going to be. You know, um, and Bob being one of the, you know, one of those excitable forces. You know, we all know Bob, always happy. Yeah. always excited right. always positive so mm -hmm. me and dave we go down to meet bob <clears throat> i seem to think it was redondo beach uh we literally go do the interview with bob on the beach you know i like <laughs> sun tanning out on the beach you know <laughs> and uh <clears throat> which is what was so memorable about it is that's how i always remember bob was like it's very bizarre to do a freaking heavy metal magazine interview <laughs> on the beach in California. Shouldn't it be dark and satanic? And, no, it's sunny. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. And um, so Bob, of course, so Bob in Southern Cal, Ron Quintana up in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, of course, there's the book. I have it here, uh, you know, Murder in the Front Row. Brian Liu. Oh, sure. Uh, sure. Cool. Brian, Dave actually had us, had Brian kind of running our quote unquote fan club, meaning he oversaw a post office box where the letters would show up. <laughs> uh, right, right. And uh, he'd, he'd send them down to us. You know, Metal Maria, who of course has adrenaline PR, so, you know, big, sure. big league publicist now. You know, she was, she, you know, she was a big. Dave saw him play with Metallica out at uh, out of the you know in the East Coast um, before they signed with Megaforce Records, like your T-shirt says. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so all these people, you know, East Coast, West Coast. Bernard Doe from Metal Forces was in the UK, and you know Lars, and I think because he was from Denmark, you know, he understood the international connection that needed to happen. You know, Dave Dave told me that Lars is you know first uh kind of mantra or mindset with metallica was to be the you know the u.s motorhead right i think that was right. kind of the original dream for him right so mm -hmm. you know he understood that you know you had to get your your music out to these people so the so the bob nobandians of the world and in particular bob you know they knew that when you got a demo um the no life to leather demo for metallica being sort of the crown jewel of of success you know you get those demos out the buzz spreads you know today if you did that you're basically giving your songs away on the internet right you'll never get them back but back in those days people you wanted people to spread the demo around because it's how uh bob and ron and bernard doe and all these guys and malcolm dome who was uh, writing for kerrang and various things <clears throat> you know you wanted that buzz because that's what got the likes of megaforce and <laughs> combat records interested in your band it was sort of mm -hmm. early sure. early a and r pr you know so we mm -hmm. did the same thing we had a um a three-song demo of uh i think it was love to death 
mechanics and scope beneath the skin, I think, if I'm okay. correct. Um, and so we had the same thing. We got a little play on KMET, which was the other. KMET and KLOS were the two stations in L.A., and KMET had like a Saturday night heavy metal hour. That was where I first heard Queen of the Reich by Queensryche. Okay. You know, they okay. would play Armored Saints, who were coming up the ranks, had just gotten signed, I guess, to Chrysalis. Um, <clears throat> Warrior fighting for the earth, you know, these Mm, these were the things that were buzzing around in the underground. And of course, Megadeth, you know, being certainly one of the fastest, more ferocious ones. And a lot of excitement, of course, for Dave, you know, post Metallica. So, um, you know, we got to start our band, you know, a few rungs up the ladder, um, you know, because Dave had already paid some of those dues with Metallica, um, you know, playing around the Southern Cal area. But, you know, we never played the Sunset Strip or any of that stuff. I mean, Dave not only did not did he not want to because he knew he hated the whole pay to play thing, which I agree with. <laughs> but so we had to play these like outlier punk rock theaters, you know, like the Balboa Theater right. and all these kind of, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. these grungy punk rock theaters were like Black Flag and <laughs> shit would play, you know, because mm-hmm. that and, and it was great because, you know, there's no chairs you know the thrashers could fucking mosh and you know stage dive and you know it was you know the audience was part of the act i mean i think we were as entertained as they were (laughs) (laughs) nice yeah well so dave i mean i you know um one of the things about bob um you know is obviously everyone knows like i say he's very connected to the megadeth camp and one of the things i'm going to bring up just right here for a second is this is obviously he was put into the um, rust in peace book uh, that came sure. out a few years ago, um, yeah. and obviously, it, you know, Bob obviously introduced uh, introduced Marty Friedman into the band. That's one of the things that he's you know uh, more well known for uh, with in terms of his relation with the camp. But you know, one of the things it says here in the book and right on uh, the quotes right there, it says that he was still one of the band's oldest and truest friends. You know, really mm-hmm. up until I mean, you know, these today or you know up until at least this book was uh, put out. So what was it about, uh, you know, Bob that really made, you know, that, that made him one of the quote unquote, you know, most truest fans, excuse me, friends of the band um, over the years? I mean, obviously you guys have worked and been connected with so many people, you know, being a mega. Mm-hmm. What was it about Bob that stood <clears throat> out amongst everybody else, in your opinion? <clears throat> well, you know, you liked Bob before. As soon as you saw him, you liked him because he had just like there got the big electric smile walks Mm -hmm. in the room he's happy you know the world could be falling apart everything could be going to to hell in a handbasket bob walks in and suddenly everything's okay (laughs) you know what i mean Mm because he was just that guy um he was eternally optimistic and happy um you know i don't think the guy had a mean bone or an enemy anywhere um everybody liked him he was a Mm -hmm. fan of everything and everyone I mean, a genuine fan, not a not a schmoozy guy, so he could get backstage and drink your beer, you know, because mm-hmm. there was plenty of those guys too. Um, but sure. you know, like the guy who just really, you always let Bob in the room, you know what I mean? Because he was just, he was genuine, he was heartfelt, and maybe it's because he's from Orange County, mm-hmm. and you know, he wasn't part of the hustle of of the Sunset Strip, you know, because when you live there. And I had to learn how to do it too. You got to learn how to hustle and bullshit and get your way in the room. And you know what I mean? It's just, it's that thing. And I think Bob not being from that culture, <clears throat> but truly being, you know, a fan who like all of us bought your Iron Maiden records or whatever it is, you took them home, you listened to them on your stereo and you just became a fan. I mean, he was that guy. And I think that's why everybody liked him. <clears throat> of course, you know, Brian Slagle from Metal Blade Records, you know, he was another one of the guys, not a journalist, but a label mm-hmm. guy, Johnny Z, sure. you know, on the East Coast, you know, so there's all mm-hmm. these players in the scene of, of, of that helped this thing get off the ground and become what it was. And, and it was all fan driven. It wasn't money driven. It wasn't profit yeah. motive. It, um, it was just for the love of the scene and to be part of something. And I think that's why when we did the big four, you know, back in, you know, 2010 and 2011 that's why it was even so special is because this was a family reunion not just of the four bands but of everybody that was a part of it you sure. know, such a celebration so you know i think with bob um look we we interviewed him for the uh, nick menza movie that will mm-hmm. uh, hopefully we'll get that out next year well um, that was the last time i saw bob <clears throat> and that would have been uh january it was a year ago january of uh, 2022 when we were filming the interviews <clears throat> and he gave us some great stories and <clears throat> you know, he is as, as 
happy-go-lucky as Bob is when he spoke, he spoke with authority because he was there. He knew what he was talking about. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And you're right. I always forget about the Marty Freeman thing, ironically, because he was good friends with our manager at the time, Ron Lafitte, who, mm-hmm. again, was another guy, um, was friends with Armored Saint. He was the tour manager for the Wasp Metallica Armored Saint tour. He tour managed Armored Saint. He, he grew up with those guys. You know, Ron worked his way up into, uh, you know, into management, you know, want to just give anything to manage Megadeth. Um, I actually convinced Dave he should be our manager. I guess he'd always come to me. You know, guys would come to me to get to Dave, you know. And so after after a few, you know, hangs with Ron, I love Ron. And, you know, Ron was like like Dave, you know, or I mean, like, like Bob, like uh, just one of the happy faces. You'd always let him in the room, um, you know, and, and so – you know, Ron managed us from uh, 89 through uh, into the, you know, euthanasia record. So, you know, our big years, you know, and a lot of that success certainly goes to Ron. You know, he, he knew how to captain the ship, you know. So, um, so yeah, he, I guess he's the one who, you know, hit Ron and said, hey, you know, can we give Marty an audition? So, um, and then Ron, you know, got that over to me and Dave. And in fact, it was funny that when it happened, because we were actually up in, Ron's Ron was part of Lipman and Kahane and um <clears throat> Kahane, Rob Kahane, his big artist was George Michael at the top of his hmm. career, you know, in the late eighties, right, late 90s. Sure. I think he managed him maybe through his whole career, but um so that was the big thing. And the and the Lipman uh brothers, they managed uh producers. That's how Mike Clink got into producer okay. Rustin Peace because they managed okay. Mike Clink. So Ron was in there. He worked in their office. He was, you know, that's, and that was right across the street from Tower Records there. So we were cutting the demos for uh, the Rust in Peace album in December of 89. And it was just me, Dave, and Nick Menza. <clears throat> we didn't have a good, just, just like so far as a good so what, whereas me, Dave, and Chuck, you know, and then right. we brought Jeff in to play some solos. He joined the band. Well, we, we, we hired Chris Poland to come in and play some solos. Just if nothing as a placeholder, you know, we knew he wasn't going to rejoin the band per se, but, um, and then we went down on a break. We went a couple floors down to the Lipman and Kane office, down to Ron's office, and we saw Dragon's Kiss and the Cacophony record sitting on Ron's desk. And um, <clears throat> I, I remember we picked him up and goes, so what's up with this guy, you know? And, and Ron was, and Ron said, he goes, dude, I've been telling you guys, we should give this guy an audition. And me and Dave was just like, why not? We just tried 20 other guys that didn't work. You know, we got nothing to lose, you know, because we knew we were going to be going to the studio in a couple of months to record the rest of Beast record. So that's how it happened. And we and we knew of Marty because from, from Hawaii, because I remember mm-hmm. uh, Bailoff from Exodus, you know, Dave is friends with those guys. So Bailoff and Exodus' manager, Adam, forgot his last name, but they came down when, when Dave and I first met. We were living on Sycamore. And Bailoff would come down, and, and I remember him just sitting over in the corner smoking bongs like a Buddha, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and going, dude, this is friendly, man, this is friendly. And that was his thing, friendly, you know. It was like, oh, this is friendly, man. you know, and, and um, <clears throat> we're listening to Hawaii fitting the pendulum and all this stuff. So I, I you know, so we knew of Marty. <clears throat> um, so um, and I think the way Marty really won the audition is is he when he he hired a guitar tech. You know, Marty did it right. Marty, Marty was so broke, he didn't have a penny to his name, but he scrounged together a favor or enough money to have a guitar tech come in, set all this shit up, so when the Marty could walk in like a rock star, pick up his guitar and play. And right. and I think just his whole professional pr- approach to it won him the gig as much as anything else. It's like, okay, this guy gets what this level is, you know? Like, this isn't sure. some garage band. Because, I mean, when we after did our first round of auditions with me and Dave and Nick Menza, I mean, guys would come in, and I remember one guy comes in, and and, and he, he literally, he, he plugs his guitar in, and, you know, he's got his shirt tucked in, his pants pulled up, and like, okay, this look is all wrong, right? <laughs> White jeans. <laughs> and we're like, he definitely didn't dress for the gig, right? So, again, you know, you kind of, assess the guy when he's walking in the door all right is this guy is even thinking like we do and he stands there and he puts his hands on his hip he goes okay so show me the songs we're like show you the songs like you should know the songs this is the audition this isn't where we you know you know you're supposed to blow our minds right now with how awesome you are you know and um, we had another guy come in and he was like doing his richie blackmore thing you know swing, you know, swinging his cord at his guitar and doing all this like you know <laughs> 
take it down a notch, dude. You're like way, <laughs> way stepping out of your lane. So, I mean, right. we had all these kind of guys. So, you know, to see Marty come in, you know, and, and just do it right, you know, look the part, played the part, you know, knew the music as good as anybody could not having been in the room when the music was written. Cause there's a lot of detail to the music. Um, so, you know, again, speaking back to Bob's instincts, he knew, you know, he knew like, this is the guy, you know? So right. you know, that's, um, you know, so again, big, big kudos. We'll, we'll give that one to Bob for sure. You know? Absolutely. Well, and, and, you know, over the course of the 40 years, Dave, the, um, the, the biggest thing, and, and we're hearing this from everybody. And I think Matt and I both echo it as well. As long as I've known Bob, which is a whole lot less than you have same guy, you know, never changed, totally. never, never <clears throat> changed in attitude and spirit. I mean, to his dying day, positive, yeah. didn't want people to worry about him. You know, I mean, you know, I told you, and the first thing you were like, the first thing you said to me was, what happened? Was he sick? You know, he yeah. he didn't want people to <clears throat> worry. He wasn't that guy. He he didn't want credit for anything. He didn't want, all he wanted to do was be part of a scene and help it grow and, right. and just be cool with people. And I think that might be a good place for us to wrap this up with is, you know, for you, you obviously knew Bob and have been friends yeah. with Bob for 40 years and have done his movies. He's obviously had huge influence on your career with Marty and just in general, right. his promotion of Megadeth and other stuff. So to wrap it up, why don't you give us kind of a summation of your, you know, your 40 year history with Bob Nalbandian? Sure. Well, look, you know, um, <clears throat> you texted me. I was uh, with James Rivera. It was uh, the night, it was December 30th when James and I were doing a show in Houston and I was right. literally sitting at dinner before the show and your tech shows up on <laughs> and they said, Bob Nobanian passed. I'm like, what the hell, what happened? You know? And, and um, cause again, I saw him in January. We filmed his, his segment. We actually got in the car, drove down the street to Starbucks. We got caught up. We were sure. bullshitting and just hanging out. Um, <clears throat> he, you know, and he was so positive to me. He was like, man, he goes, you just keep going. Everything you're doing is just great, man. You're on point. Just keep at it. You're, you know, everything that you're doing mm -hmm. with the Lucid, the movie, and all this other stuff. So he was so encouraging to me in this next season of my life to just keep going, man. Just, just stay the course and 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 genuine, not like trying to just, you know, fluff me up, but mm -hmm. like really genuine. Like, dude, you're you're on you're on it. You know, keep keep going. You know. So and that to me was, you know, real friendship. Uh, you know, not just as a, you know, as a former Megadeth guy, but just as me, you know, Bob and David, you know, so that's, yeah. that's the genuineness that from him that he had. And, um, <clears throat> and then, um, you know, I can't remember, you know, Drew Fortier, when he was going through his cancer, he said that Bob had reached out to him um, and yeah. I guess had revealed to him that he was going through uh, you know, his own, you know, battle, um, at the time. And, mm -hmm. and, and you, I guess he'd relocated up North to Northern California to be with his parents. Right. And then you, you kind of gave me the backstory as well, Chris, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that day you texted me and I was like, and I was like, God, I, I was trying to remember. I was like, did he even tell me this? I can't remember. Or maybe he just alluded like, yeah, I'm going to move back up North. You know, he was very, again, like you said, and it wasn't that he was hiding anything. He just didn't want anybody to worry about him. He's like, yeah. just, you know, don't worry about me. You know, he was so selfless. And I think that that probably sums up Bob. If there's one word, he was selfless. You know, he never had any of this stuff so that he could take the spotlight on him. He never tried to step into our spotlight. He always knew his place. No, the, you know, to, just to wrap up about Bob, you know, he, um, I was saying if there's one word to describe him, it would be selfless. You know, mm -hmm. he never did any of this for any self-promotion. He wasn't like trying to pimp his YouTube numbers, <laughs> you know, trying to right. improve his, you know, his position yep. in the business. He just, he was, he was just completely selfless in everything that he did. He did it just out of the pure love and the passion. And, um, you know, I think, you know, for me, he was just such a, such a supporter of me personally, you know, and, and it wasn't, you know, what I had to be in Megadeth or not, you know, it wasn't that it was just, he just told me, man, you keep going. Everything you're doing is on point. Just, just stay, stay the course. You're doing great right now. And, and, um, but yeah, when he, you know, I think when he, um, <clears throat> you know, he never, he never mentioned 
that I can remember anything about having uh, cancer. You know, I think he just said he might be relocating back up to North to be with his parents. And he didn't, he, and it was because he, I think he really honestly didn't want anybody to worry about him. And, yeah. um, you know, there's no shame. I don't think he was, he was embarrassed or anything. He was just like, you just keep going, David, you do your thing, man. And just, you know, and, and, and don't worry about me. <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm good over here. So I think that was, was, was so shocking um, about that when, uh, when, you know, I got the text from you, Chris, that he had passed, but um, you know, Bob, I think, you know, he lived a great life. He was a man of integrity. He finished strong. Everybody, I'm sure every one of these podcasts or comments that I ever saw online, everybody just loves the guy, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what a great way to finish off your time on earth, you know, of leaving that kind of a legacy behind of just being selfless and, and just always one to come and, and help and, and pitch in and, and just be part of the goodwill. Right. And, and I, the, the irony of irony, at least to me, no matter what level anybody's been at that has said something online about Bob, not a bad word, none not from fans word. to, from yeah. fans to, you know, the highest heights of rock stars, everybody has positive things. And that's, that's rare these days. You know, that's yeah, very yeah. rare. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, yeah, you know, e even for journalists, <laughs> because journalists <laughs> have usually shit talked somebody or given a two star review <laughs> on some album. You know, they've done something. Right? You know, Bob, Bob just always shot straight. And you know, you're, I always forget. You know, Bob would always call me to you know to participate in his movies he was doing. He hired yeah. me to narrate several yeah. of his of his films, um, and um, you know, it was always just you know. Um, you know, he would just always think of me, you know, and it just randomly out of nowhere, some email or call would come from Bob. Hey, do you want to be part of this? Or we're filming this. And I'd always give him access to the shows and get him in. And, you know, I remember filming stuff in parking lot of the arena in San Jose, just so we could get the content, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and just, you know, whatever it took, you know. Well, well, David, obviously you're busy, man, but we definitely appreciate you taking a little bit of time out yeah. to, to remember Bob yeah, and, um, you know, obviously good good travels for you with kings of thrash and um you know i'm sure bob and his family and all his friends will appreciate that you took some time man of course awesome Absolutely. see you guys awesome thanks a lot david